Chapter 29 Aunt Alexandra got up and reached for the mantelpiece. Mr. Tate rose, but she declined assistance. For once in his life, Atticus's instinctive courtesy failed him. He sat where he was. Somehow, I could think of nothing but Mr. Bob Ewell saying he'd get Atticus if it took him the rest of his life. Mr. Ewell almost got him, and it was the last thing he did. Are you sure? Atticus said bleakly. He's dead, all right, said Mr. Tate. He's good and dead. He won't hurt these children again. I didn't mean that. Atticus seemed to be talking in his sleep. His age was beginning to show, his one sign of inner turmoil. The strong line of his jaw melted a little. One became aware of telltale creases forming under his ears. One noticed not his jet black hair, but the gray patches growing at his temples. Hadn't we better go to the living room? Aunt Alexandra said at last. If you don't mind, said Mr. Tate, I'd rather us stay in here, if it won't hurt Jam any. I want to have a look at his injuries while Scout tells us about it. Is it all right if I leave? she asked. I'm just one person too many in here. I'll be in my room if you want me, Atticus. Aunt Alexandra went to the door, but she stopped and turned. Atticus, I had a feeling about this tonight. I... This is my fault, she began. I should have... Mr. Tate held up his hand. You go ahead, Miss Alexandra. I know it's been a shock to you. And don't you fret yourself about anything. Why, if we followed our feelings all the time, we'd be like cats chasing their tails. Miss Scout, see if you can tell us what happened while it's still fresh in your mind. You think you can? Did you see him following you? I went to Atticus and felt his arms go around me. I buried my head in his lap. We started home. I said, Jim, I forgot my shoes. Soon as we started back for him, the lights went out. Jim said I could get them tomorrow. Scout, raise up so Mr. Tate can hear you, Atticus said. I crawled into his lap. Then Jem said, hush a minute. I thought he was thinking. He always wants you to hush so he can think. Then he said he heard something. We thought it was Cecil. Cecil? Cecil Jacobs. He scared us once tonight, and we thought it was him again. He had on a sheet. They gave a quarter for the best costume. I don't know who won it. Where were you when you thought it was Cecil? Just a little piece from the schoolhouse. I yelled something at him. You yelled what? Cecil Jacobs is a big fat hen, I think. We didn't hear nothing. Then Jem yelled hello or something loud enough to wake the dead. Just a minute, Scout, said Mr. Tate. Mr. Finch, did you hear them? Atticus said he didn't. He had the radio on. Aunt Alexandra had hers going in her bedroom. He remembered because she told him to turn his down a bit so she could hear hers. Atticus smiled. I always play a radio too loud. I wonder if the neighbors heard anything, said Mr. Tate. I doubt it, heck. Most of them listen to their radios or go to bed with the chickens. Morty Atkinson may have been up, but I doubt it. Go ahead, Scout, Mr. Tate said. Well, after Jem yelled, we walked on. Mr. Tate, I was shut up in my costume, but I could hear it myself then. Footsteps, I mean. They walked when we walked and stopped when we stopped. 
Jim said he could see me because Mrs. Crenshaw put some kind of shiny paint on my costume. I was a ham. How's that? asked Mr. Tate, startled. Atticus described my role to Mr. Tate, plus the construction of my garment. You should have seen her when she came in, he said. It was crushed to a pulp. Mr. Tate rubbed his chin. I wondered why he had those marks on him. His sleeves were perforated with little holes. There were one or two little puncture marks on his arms to match the holes. Let me see that thing, if you will, sir. Atticus fetched the remains of my costume. Mr. Tate turned it over and bent it around to get an idea of its former shape. This thing probably saved her life, he said. Look. He pointed with a long forefinger. A shiny, clean line stood out on the dull wire. Bob Ewell meant business, Mr. Tate muttered. He was out of his mind, said Atticus. Don't like to contradict you, Mr. Finch. Wasn't crazy. Mean as hell. Low-down skunk with enough liquor in him to make him brave enough to kill children. He'd never have met you face to face. Atticus shook his head. I can't conceive of a man who'd... Mr. Finch, there's just some kind of man you have to shoot before you can say hi to him. Even then, they ain't worth the bullet it takes to shoot them. Ewell is one of them. Atticus said, I thought he got it all out of him the day he threatened me. Even if he hadn't, I thought he'd come after me. He had guts enough to pester a poor colored woman. He had guts enough to pester Judge Taylor when he thought the house was empty. So do you think he'd have met you to your face in daylight? Mr. Tate sighed. We'd better get on. Scout, you heard him behind you. Yes, sir. When we got under the tree, how'd you know you were under the tree? You couldn't see thunder out there. I was barefooted, and Jem says the ground's always cooler under a tree. We'll have to make him a deputy. Go ahead. Then... All of a sudden, something grabbed me and mashed my costume. Think I ducked on the ground. Heard a tussling under the tree, sort of. They were bamming against the trunk, sounded like. Jem found me and started pulling me toward the road. Some Mr. Yule yanked him down, I reckon. They tussled some more and then there was this funny noise. Jem hollered. I stopped. That was Jem's arm. Anyway, Jem hollered. And I didn't hear him any more. And the next thing, Mr. Yule was trying to squeeze me to death, I reckon. Then somebody yanked Mr. Yule down. Jem must have got up, I guess. That's all I know. And then? Mr. Tate was looking at me sharply. Somebody was staggering around and panting and coughing fit to die. I thought it was Jem at first, but it didn't sound like him, so I went looking for Jem on the ground. I thought Atticus had come to help us and had got wore out. Who was it? Why, there he is, Mr. Tate. He can tell you his name. As I said it, I half pointed to the man in the corner, but brought my arm down quickly, lest Atticus reprimand me for pointing. It was impolite to point. He was still leaning against the wall. He had been leaning against the wall when I came into the room, his arms folded across his chest. As I pointed, he brought his arms down and pressed the palms of his hands against the wall. They were white hands, 
sickly white hands that had never seen the sun. So white, they stood out garishly against the dull cream wall in the dim light of Jem's room. I looked from his hands to his sand-stained khaki pants. My eyes traveled up his thin frame to his torn denim shirt. His face was as white as his hands, but for a shadow on his jutting chin. His cheeks were thin to hollowness. His mouth was wide. There were shallow, almost delicate indentations at his temples, and his gray eyes were so colorless I thought he was blind. His hair was dead and thin, almost feathery on top of his head. When I pointed to him, his palms slipped slightly, leaving greasy sweat streaks on the wall, and he hooked his thumbs in his belt. A strange small spasm shook him, as if he heard fingernails scrape slate. But as I gazed at him in wonder, the tension slowly drained from his face. His lips parted into a timid smile, and our neighbor's image blurred with my sudden tears. Hey, boo, I said. <laughs>